Hello, I'm Kenneth Dentley, and welcome today to our online teaching. Listen, do I have a message that will stir your heart? It also will bring a little um, conviction to you as well. So there's nothing new. You know, I just wanted to share with you a message that I had an opportunity to minister at our church um, when I talked about the subject entitled Distractions. And this is a very important subject because right now, there's so many things that's going on in the world right now. And we as the church, the believer, those who are Christian, who name the name of Christ. Now, that's four things that I said already about a believer. You know, we have got to mark the time that we are now living in. And we cannot allow ourselves to become so distracted with the things of the world or the things concerning this life. And I'm going to tell you why in this particular teaching. But I want you to understand that the things that we are saying and sharing with you is for the purpose of helping prepare the bride for the coming of her, her prince or her husband. Uh, there are so many things that we, we try to share with people concerning the coming of the Lord. And I think, you know, this is a subject that kind of Christians right now, they take the attitude that, you know what, oh, we've heard that for such a long time. You know, I've been hearing about the coming of the Lord since I've been a little boy, and that was over 50 years ago. So I want to share with you that the Bible talks about how we ought, to, um, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So when we hear them and hear them and hear them and we don't see anything come to pass, then we begin to let it slip. But I'm telling you right now, we are so close to the coming of the Lord. And the thing that I want to share with you is going to help shape your life and shape your attention to keep you focused on the main thing. I tell my son sometime, Keep the main thing, the main thing. And that's the return of the Lord right now. We want to make sure that we are ready, just like the five wise virgins that uh, took, um, took their lamps and took oil with them. And the Bible says that when the bridegroom uh, tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And the Bible lets us know the time came when the announcement was made, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And they all arose and they trimmed their lamps. And guess what? Those five virgins that did not have any oil, did not bring extra oil with them, their oil had ran out, and so therefore they didn't have no light. And so what we want to do, we want to share with you these messages that's going to help you to keep oil in your lamps. This is the light of the Word of God that's going to help us to be prepared and ready for when the bridegroom comes. So I want you to sit back and listen very attentively and grab something, grab a cup of tea, cup of coffee, you know, whatever your cappuccino, whatever water, whatever you have, you know, and just listen attentively. And share it with someone else. At the end of this um, teaching, I'm going to come back and I'm going to share a little bit more things with you. And I want you to just listen very attentively if I share the message entitled, Distractions. Tonight, I, I'll tell you what, touch your ear right now and just say, Lord, open my ears that I may hear. Touch your heart right there. Lord, touch my heart that I may receive. And say, Lord, touch my understanding that I may understand. Tonight, I want to talk to you from a subject that I would like to entitle, Guarding Yourself Against Distractions. Guarding Yourself Against Distractions. How many of you know that there are many distractions in this world today? Wow. You're doing your best to try to walk this journey called life. And there are things that are pulling on you on the left and on the right. Amen. Not all of those things are bad. Some of them are bad. Some of them are good. But we need to learn how to guard ourselves from being distracted from, uh, from everything that comes to try to entice us and lure us away from our purpose. Amen? Amen? God has a plan for every one of our lives tonight. And let me tell you something, folks. If you read, let me, let me say this. If you have not read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I would suggest you go back and read it. And when I say read it, I mean just don't read it to say, well, I've read it. I want you to read it with understanding. You've got to hear what the words of Jesus said. I thank God for the Old Covenant. I thank God for all the writings, of 60, you know, the books that are in the, um, the Old Testament. But folks, you've got to hear the words of Jesus. It is so important. You remember when the Bible says that um, Peter and John and James went up in the mountain. The Bible says that um, Jesus was transfigured on the mount. You remember that in the Bible? See, some of you haven't read the New Testament, so you never read that one before. But it's in there. He talked about how the Bible says when, when Peter saw Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus, the Bible said that Peter said, uh, Lord, it's good for us to be here. You know, uh, uh, let us make three tabernacles. 
And the Bible said that a cloud came down and overshadowed them, and a voice spoke out of the cloud, said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Now listen to what I'm saying here. When God spoke, the voice that came out of heaven spoke, what he was saying is that you hear what my son is saying. Moses represented the law, because the law was given by Moses. Elijah represented the prophets. So you ever hear them talk about the law and the prophets? That's the whole entire Old Testament. But God said out of heaven, you've heard what Moses said, you've heard what the prophet says, now this is my beloved son, hear him. So many of us have not, and in the book of Hebrews, if you read the entire book of Hebrews, you find out that the Hebrews, the writer of the book of Hebrews, is telling the saints of God that Jesus is superior to Moses, the angels, and everything that has been created. He is first and foremost. He has preeminence. So if you hear anything, you need to hear what Jesus said. And let me show you, this is so imperative for these days and times now because one of the things that Jesus constantly said he said, let no man deceive you. Hello? Read how many times Jesus said that. Look it up. He says, let no man. He always talked about deception, all deception. You know, even in the book of Revelation, my God, my wife says, stay on course. I'm going to get back on track. But here, even in the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us that, that when, the, when the horsemen of the apocalypse, the four horsemen are being released, the first horse to be released is a white horse. Now, if you look at that white horse, you may think that that white horse stands for Jesus, but it doesn't stand for Jesus. The Bible says he was given a bow and he went forth to conquer and to conquer. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus is not conquering. He's inviting. He's telling you now, while the age of grace is still here, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not, he don't have a bow. When Jesus shows up on the white horse, he don't have a bow. He has a sword. He has a name written on his thigh called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So you got to understand, folks, you need to hear what Jesus has said. And we need to live according to the teachings of Jesus. Jesus tells us things like this. He said, you've heard that it's been said by them of old time, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But Jesus comes along and he said, but I say unto you, love your enemy. Uh-oh. Do good to those that despitefully. See, those are the kinds of things that Jesus said. That's how the kingdom operates. And if you're going to be a kingdom citizen, you're going to have to operate according to those laws. People talking about want to go to heaven and want to be a part of the kingdom, but they're not familiar with the laws of the kingdom. So Jesus tells us how the kingdom of God operates. So you need to find out, listen, if I'm going to go to France, or let's, let's strike France, if I'm going to go to Saudi Arabia, I'm going to have to learn something about their customs before I go. Because I can go over there and preach in the street and guess what, get arrested and probably beheaded. Because that's not allowed there, it's not permissible there. So if you're going to be a part of another kingdom, so we are citizens of God's kingdom, you got to understand what God requires of us. He, you as a citizen of God's kingdom need to know the laws of the kingdom, the laws that govern the kingdom. Give and it shall be given unto you is not the only law of the kingdom. The Bible says forgive if you have heart against any. See, that's the law of the kingdom. You can't, as a kingdom citizen, you can't expect to be a part of the kingdom and break the law of forgiveness. Because God says things like this, as I've forgiven you, so you must forgive others. It's still in love. Let's talk about distractions. There's a king called Solomon. How many of you ever heard of Solomon? Solomon was known as the wisest king. It's amazing. He was the wisest king, but the most foolish king. With all the wisdom that he had, yet he was a fool. He was. I did not contradict the scripture. It's in there. He was a foolish man. Solomon, in chapter 3, turn there in 1 Kings chapter 3. Let me show you something here. The Bible says in verse number 1, Oh, Lord, I thank you. Y'all there yet? Let's look at verse 3. The Bible says, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burnt incense at the high places. 
Now, it starts off by talking about Solomon's beginning. He loved the Lord. Notice the Bible says he what? Loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Notice he had a love and affection for God. And notice, and, and we're going to just flip forward. I, I got scriptures, but I can't go through all these scriptures right now because it'd take too long. And if you fast forward or advance to chapter 6, the Bible talks about in chapter 6 how Solomon built a house or a temple for the Lord. I mean, this was a palatial place, man. This, was, this place was, there was no building on earth during that time that was compatible to the temple that Solomon built for his God. Are you with me? And then we can fast forward to chapter 7 here and Solomon built his house. And his house was bad too. You understand what I'm saying? He had a spread. And then we can advance to chapter 8 and see how Solomon brought the ark of the Lord. You know, the Bible says in verse number 1 in chapter 8, Now Solomon assembled all the elders of the of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers and the children of Israel to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they may bring up the ark of the covenant, which, which stands for the presence of the Lord, of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. So therefore, you understand what I'm saying? Now we see the progression of Solomon. He's doing pretty good. You think these are pretty good things, right? He wanted the presence of the Lord. First of all, we saw that he loved the Lord. The second thing that we saw, he advanced in. The Bible says that, you know, he built a house for the Lord. Then the next thing after he builds his house, he calls for the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, to come to where he built the tabernacle, I mean the temple. But notice something else. The Bible says in chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse number 22, he stood before the Lord, before the altar, rather, of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. Then he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven above or in earth below like you who keep your covenant and mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their heart. So here he is, he's saying, Lord, you, I'm making a covenant. I'm reaffirming the covenant that my father David made with you. And that starts at verse number, what we say, verse number 22, and he kept on going to the end of the chapter. So we see here in chapter 10, here it is. The queen of Sheba comes and visits Solomon and lavishes a whole lot of jewelry, a lot of expensive gifts, gold and all kinds of things upon him just to hear his wisdom and just to be in his presence. How many of you would say Solomon was doing pretty good? But then something happens along the way. What used to be happy is sad. Something happened along the way, and yesterday was all we had. <laughs> How many of y'all know the rest of it? <laughs> Let me hear it. That's right. Oh, after the love is gone. Notice what the Bible says in chapter 11, verse number 1. But, don't go any further. Whenever you hear but, you know something is coming. He loved the Lord, built the Lord a house. After he built his house, he, built, he brought the furnishings and all the Ark of the Covenant in. Queen of Sheba come and lavish gifts upon him to hear his wisdom. But here's something that Solomon never saw coming. The Bible says, but Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, the Sidon, yeah, and the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you, for they surely will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in what? And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And this is the part that I want you to see. And what happened? His wives turned away his heart. Everyone say distracted. <clears throat> That's why I think it's so important to talk about distractions. Because after all of the things, when we first started out with the Lord, how we, we just, we just, the Lord was always on our lips. We always telling somebody our story, our testimony, how the Lord brought us out with a shout, no doubt, you know. 
and all these great things that the Lord has done for us. And, and, and we were in the Bible. We were always in church, you know. Uh, uh, just, we was just, just, just everything. Jesus, 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 Jesus. People got sick of you talking about Jesus simply because the Lord came and invaded your space. You remember how it was when you first fell in love? Oh, man, you can... What? When you first fell in love, that's all you can think about is that girl. My girl. Talking about my girl. <laughs> I don't know where the hell this, these songs are coming from tonight, you know? But, but you understand, right? And so, you know, the thing about it is, is that, you know, we spent time. I mean, you wanted to see her. You always wanted to be around her. You always wanted, you know, on the nighttime, you're home and she's home and, you know, you're in the bed, you're talking on the phone. When you run out of things to say, you don't have anything else to say. You, what did you say something? Yeah. No, I didn't say anything. I just, just listen to you breathe. You know, you had such a, an affection. You know, you go to the mall together. Guys, you would pull that wallet out and you would buy anything for her on a brink. I'm telling you. Am I telling the truth? But then something happened along the way. It don't always end that way. We get married and all of a sudden things go south. He don't pull out his wallet anymore. He hides his wallet. <laughs> we don't talk on the phone no more. What you want? You, she calls on the phone and said, you know, there's something Charmaine calls me. She, she always had this, this, this thing in her voice. It was always happy and exciting. You know, when she calls me or whatever. And she got this little saying that she says to me, I'm crazy about you, boy. And it just sent, sent chills through my spine. You know, even until this day, she got this little, this little thing on her face where she said, I'm crazy about you, boy. Even after 21 years, she's still crazy about me. That, that, that girl crazy about me, man. <laughs> <laughs> but we had to fight for that because there were times when I was so distracted but she never lost focus she never lost focus in her attention on, on her marriage the man that she fell in love with oh my goodness I tell you the truth I didn't mean to talk about your baby like that but I'm telling you the truth I got to tell you the truth and this is what happened. Solomon loved the Lord. He started off with a love for love, but something came along the way that distracted him. See, you got to understand, folks. Listen, please hear what I'm saying. God, help me to articulate this correctly. There is something in every one of us born-again believers that God has to put to the test because there are some things that we prefer over him. Every one of us have that thing that we would, <laughs> that we would almost give up Jesus for. God knows it, and, but you, you, you're so, you, you don't know it. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and, and, and desperately wicked, and who can know it? The only one that can know your true heart is God himself. And see, God knows what's on the inside. He knows what sits on the throne of your life besides him. And he said, I am God, and I will have no other gods before me. He said, I will share my glory with no one. And so there's some things in our lives that distract us. So God allowed those things to rear his ugly head just to see what our response will be. This thing didn't just pop up with Solomon. He had an affection for women for a long time. The same thing with his father David. He loved women more than he loved God. And you know why you know that? Because the Bible says but his, the women, his wives, turned his heart away from him. What was wrong with this man that he needed 700 wives and 300 concubines? What was wrong on the inside? He had a dissatisfaction that nothing, he was a wisest king. Now understand what I'm saying? He had a gift, but inside he had a burning dissatisfaction. Nothing pleased him. He had money. It didn't please him. He had women. It didn't please him. Gold and silver and horses and everything. He had the kingship. He had the king, all servants at his command. And it wasn't enough. So what is it in you that competes with God? That's not enough on the inside. Every one of us have that. Let's, let's keep going. Are you getting anything out of this? Listen to this. When a person is distracted, he or she is made to turn aside, diverted, to draw or to direct one's attention to a different object 
or different directions at the same time. You're walking forward, but you're looking at something beside. Does that make sense to you? It is to stir up or confuse with conflicting emotions or motives. Have you ever had two lovers at the same time? Have you ever, oh Lord, <laughs> just look straight ahead. Have you ever dated two at a time? You know, I would say brothers, but some of the sisters, you know, they're doing that kind of stuff too, you know. Hello, somebody. You married to this one, but you love that one. Don't look at me with that tone of voice. I ain't scared of y'all. I'm trying to tell you what the truth of the matter is. <laughs> I didn't call nobody's name. So if it finds you, just look ahead and laugh when everybody else laugh and grin when everybody else grin and nobody will know I'm talking about you. But it is possible. Amusement. When a person is distracted, they are entertained. They are, their, their, their attention has been diverted as to deceive. My God, look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 20. Let's go there right quick. Are you serious? 1130? Ah, <sighs> that clock. Time waits for no man, not even the preachers. Look at this. In Proverbs 4, the Bible says in verse number 20, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your what? Heart. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. He's warning us here. He says, keep your heart. Guard your heart. One translation may make the word. I think it's in King James. says, guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it springs the issues of life. And I'm sorry, I forgot to tell y'all that I'm reading from the New King James Version, so if they're saying something that's different, that's the only reason why, okay? Put away from you a deceitful mouth and perverse lips. Put it far from you. Let your eyes look what? Straight ahead. Let your what? Eyes look what? Straight ahead. Before you, ponder the path of your feet and let your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to left. Remove your foot from evil. So he's giving us a warning here. He's telling us how we should walk. We should walk with our eyes straight in front of us. But when we get distracted or baited or enticed by something else, guess what happens? We begin to fall. As long as David was on the throne, as long as he was doing what he was supposed to do, the scripture says that when the, the time came when the kings were supposed to go to battle, where was David? David stayed home. And while he was home, he was looking over his big kingdom and everything that he had already conquered. And the Bible says he looked over the balcony and he saw a woman that was beautiful. She wasn't only beautiful, she was naked. David reacted just like some of us would. We would look. And then look again. <laughs> but it wasn't enough for him to look at the third or the second time or whatever. I don't know how the story went, but you know what? David apparently lusted or wanted or coveted or desired something that was not permissible for him to have. And not only did it stop there, he wanted to know who she was. What's her name? Years ago, here's a song, another song. Can we talk for a moment? Girl, I want to know your name. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know where this stuff comes from tonight. <laughs> Can I get some water here? I need some. So that's right, fellas, it's not enough. I, I want to know who, who's, who's that guy, who's that girl, who's that girl? Who is she? I got to know who she is. I need a phone number. I want to, what's her email address? What happened? You got distracted. How many times people come, young ladies especially, they come to church and get on fire, they love God, they're serving in the church, and all of a sudden some guy comes in and slips her a business card. And now she comes to church just to see him she wanted to see the Lord. What happened? She got distracted. Everyone say distracted. distracted. Let me just tell, tell you a simple way to, to, to deal with distraction here. Let me share what it really means in layman's term. Two words, dis. What does this mean? Not. Track. 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 Where, where is he? Oh, there he is right there. Jason. Track. When you're running track, you have to stay in your what? Lane. When you're running track, you're not concerned about who's in the stands. Am I correct? You keep your eyes straight ahead, right? In your lane, right? So that means to not be on track. 
That's all distraction means. So that means if you're tracking this way and you're looking that way, you're not going to win the race. You're not going to win the race. Why? Because you are distracted. How many of you know that there are times, I don't know about the runners or whatever, but you can be running a certain way, and if you look in this way right here, you're going to begin to change directions because that's what you're looking, that's where your focus and attention is, and that's what the enemy's plan and plot is. He comes to distract you. I've seen them come to church, catching the bus to get there, every service, faithful as they want to be. Don't have a car. By the time they get that car, next thing you know, they're not there as often as they used to be. They're not as faithful and committed as they were before. What happened? They got this. Everything else became of more priority and importance. Things can, that can distract. This is a list. Number one, amusement. Y'all hear me talk about this all the time. Entertainment, TV shows, movies, videos, music, etc. I used to work for Turner Broadcasting in Atlanta, Georgia. And I sat at those tables, even in Charlotte, North Carolina, I worked for um, Time Warner Cable, lease access, lease access department. And I sat with some, some executives and listened to the plans in order to get people to watch their channel because that's how they make money. And I heard the plots and the plans. God allowed me to be in those some of the things. They target you. They track you. They distract you. Are you with me? Entertainment. That, that words come from two French words. Entour, entour. I think I'm pronouncing it right. And tame. It means to, cont- to cause something to enter into you and contain. In other words, you think you're just sitting there watching a TV program, but what's really happening is that you're containing what you hear. Many of you, I'll just give you an example, just by the last election, just a few days ago, you, your, your, your sway of vote was determined by the news media. What the media, the propaganda the media sold you on either candidate is what you believed. You didn't verify any of the facts. You just simply believed what they were saying is true. And as a result, it determined your opinion about who to vote for. Hello? Because that's how it works. Entertainment, television. That's why most of the time you come to my house, that thing's not even on. Because I know the plans that they have for you. Plans to destroy you and not to prosper you. To give you no hope and no future. That's why I don't watch it. I sat in those meetings. I don't watch it. I know what they're doing. Bless the Lord. You don't believe me? All right. Sit down and watch soap operas. Tied and down he comes on commercial. What happens when you go to the grocery store and you need some washing detergent and you need some softener? You're not going to get brand X, are you? You're going to get your favorite brand that you saw on television because they sold you that this is the better brand. They even pit one against the other. Why do you drive the car you drive? You probably saw a commercial and say, that's the kind of car I want. What are they doing? They're selling you on something. So they are telling you you're going to look better if you only get this. You're going to drive. Everybody's going to love you if you get this. Or you're going to smell better. Your clothes are going to be very fresh. And, you know, come on, all of these things because that's what they tell you. (laughs) I know how it works. Entertainment, media, they're targeting you. They're programming you. Jobs. In the book of um, Luke, the Bible talks about Jesus visiting some friends, Martha and Mary's home. And the Bible says that Jesus was sitting in there and he was talking to the disciples, no doubt, and Matt Lazarus was there. And, and the Bible says, and Martha was in the kitchen um, serving, doing much serving. She was, the Bible says she was cumbered about with much serving. If you read that in the Amplified Bible, it'll bring out the word distracted. She was so much distracted that she got frustrated and came in and said, Jesus, don't you care? My sister left me in this kitchen alone to get these greenbacks and, and all this fat back and, and ham hocks and all this stuff like that, cornbread and, and macaroni and cheese, and she's sitting in here listening to you. Tell her to come help me. See, she thought the more important thing was the food serving. But Jesus said he flipped the script. Notice what he said. He said she's chosen the better part. 
and that will never be taken away from her. So you think your job is of great importance. What happens when you lose it? Oh, you know how to find the church house then. Oh, the pastor call the fast. I'm going to fast. Child, put me on the prayer list. Put me on the, put, I'll, I'll, I'll be here. What time it starts? 7.30. I'll be here at 6.45. Now you want prayer. But where were you when the job? Oh, yeah, sadabashai. Ooh, that's some good preaching, Dentley. <laughs> Relationships, we already covered that, boyfriend, girlfriend stuff. You know, things of this world, fashion, parties, clubs. You know, there's still people that go to church and still go to the club. Ain't nothing wrong with going to the club. No, there's nothing wrong with going to the club. I'm serious, there's nothing wrong with going to the club. Would you go in the club? I would go into a club. Because you know what I discovered? I can be saved in the club and out of the club. But I have no desire for the club, so I don't go to the club. No desire. No desire. I said no desire. A man don't eat when he's not hungry. When he's when he's not hungry, you know. Well, actually, let's let's forget that. That and that. That ain't gonna work this time. Things of this world, sports. Brothers, I talked about sports all the time. You know what? One of men's greatest idols in America is sports. I got you. Sports. Anything you esteem more worthy of your devotion to rather than your devotion to God is called an idol. And men and women both have made idols out of sports. I'm not talking about those that's competing in it as much as I am talking about those that watch it all the time. You come and, oh Lord, I'm about to get on the men right now. You come into church parking lot and you hear discussions about whose team is the best. That's idolatry. It's quiet in the house of the river. I don't care if you, you I don't care. Y'all get mad with me and you want to. Let me tell you something. I got to tell you the truth. And you don't take my word for it, but one day you stand before Jesus and he will tally up the times that you spent in front of the television as opposed to the times that you studied the Bible. Anything that you esteem more worthy of your devotion than your devotion to God is an idol. I see guys, they call them fans. They are fanatics. That's what the word fans come from. It's short for the word fanatic. I'm a football fan. No, you are a fanatic. No, 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 no. Don't laugh because it's not funny. It's true. You are a fanatic. And something begin to happen when these things begin to lose its grip on you because that's a distraction. The time that we're living in today, we don't have time for it. We just don't have time for it. Well, you know what? Every man loves football, not me. Well, who's your favorite basketball player? I don't have one. I don't have time for that. Life is too important. Michael Jordan, when he was playing basketball, I mean, you know, I, I used to watch the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> <laughs> don't want y'all to think I wasn't there, but I'm trying to tell you right now, I had to get away from that kind of stuff. Paul said, when I became a man, I put away childish things. You can't have a conversation with your wife and children because you're in front of the football team. In front, I'm sorry, in front of the TV set watching football team. Nobody can talk to you when your game is on. See, that's something wrong with that. Don't you see? That's a fanatic. You go to a football game, fools out in the stands in negative 20 degrees, no coat on, painted all over the looking stupid just in the stand. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see, something's wrong with that. That, if, if that's not borderline demonic, I don't know what that is. I know some of you men are mad with me, but you know what? I can handle it. I can handle it because I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. In love. Because if nobody wake you and shake you and tell you that, hey, this is idolatry, you never know. Now you know. So next time you're sitting in front of that TV for the hours that you're out, you're going to hear my voice going, idolatry, 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 idolatry. <laughs> Some of y'all laughing, but money is your idol. Money can be a distraction. Why did Jesus call it the deceitfulness of riches? 
That word deceitful means false glamour. Look at it. It's in the scripture, the false glamour of riches. You think that money has a, 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 a something that deceives us. It makes us think the more we get, the more secure we are. And that is far from the truth. The more you get, the more you spend. Did you ever realize that? Someone said, well, I don't spend it, I save it. But why did God give us money to begin with? Every attitude every believer should have towards money is this. Is that number one, God gives it to us. He is the giver. He gives us the gifts, the talents, the ability, and the skill to earn it. But the Bible says, let him that stole steal no more in the book of Ephesians, but let him labor with his hands working the thing that is good that he may have to give to him that have need. We talk about tithes and offerings in the church, but little do we talk about alms giving and giving to the poor and helping those in need. That's just as important. Let me tell you something. When Jesus checks out your checkbook, how much have you been given monthly to missions and giving to orphans and giving to people that are, are forgotten? How many people are you, are you helping to preach the gospel in places that you yourself don't go? And you think this is going to bypass God's attention? It's not because he's going to judge us based on these standards. It's in the scripture. That's why I told you, you better read what Jesus said. And the Bible says there's no partiality with God. In other words, he's going to judge us all equally. He's not going to say, oh, you my brother, you get away, you get away. No, I'm not talking about you going to heaven, and I'm not talking about that right now I'm in going versus going to hell. That's not what I'm talking to believers that I believe are going to heaven. But I'm saying you got to understand it's more than just going to heaven because you got to understand when you get there, you're going to either be rewarded for what you did or you're not going to be rewarded for what you didn't do. People who've given and sold out, they're wearing crowns in heaven. Let's, let's bring you down from heaven. Let's, let's talk about in the earth because the 7,000 year, I mean, the thousand year millennial reign, when we go up to heaven to be with the Lord, we'll be rewarded at the beam of seat judgment of Christ. That's not a judgment to say whether you're going to hell or nothing. Your sins are already forgiven. But here it is, is that the rewards that you get for what you've done, that ought to mean something to you. That ought to mean something to you. I got to quit. My time has run out. I, um, I'll say this in closing. I, I'm really passionate about messages that I preach. Um, I'm passionate because I know the heart of God as a minister, just like Pastor Jackson when he's ministering to your people. And, and where's it? Yeah, yeah, thank you, sir, please. When, um, when he's preaching, as a pastor, I pastored for years. I spent the first, my 20s and 30s and part of my 40s pastoring God's people. And one of the things that was so frustrating for me is that all of the preaching and teaching, you see very little change. And that, that frustrated me. It made me feel like a failure in ministry. But one of the things that the Bible tells us as ministers to do, he told us to do, not only preach the word, be in season, not a season, but he said, rebuke, reprove, correct with all long suffering and doctrine. So all preaching is not going to be palatable to people, but you're trying to throw out the lifeline because you're trying to rescue people. You're flagging them down and waving and say, hey, wake up, guys. And they still ignore you. And the saddest thing is that most of the time I go home after preaching a sermon to the people of the church, and I would be so discouraged. I would be so under the gun because I know they didn't get it. They didn't hear it. I'll walk away from this place tonight after all of the passion, after calling and stirring and preaching and teaching and, oh, Lord. And I'll still feel like, Lord, did they get it? Yeah. Lord. I don't know why he made me like this. 
everybody else out there, my friends and things like that, preaching, you know, good, good messages, hope messages, powerful messages that, you know, oh man, prosperity messages and everything like that or whatever. And then when I get a message, he, he sends me out there and, and I got to preach this hard stuff and I got to tell people, you got to put this down, you got to put that aside, you got to stop this or whatever, as far as that's concerned. I remember when I was in my sin, I was going to a church, a trusted friend of mine. I was in sin, guys. And I never heard anything that convicted me of my sin coming out of my sin. Everything was about gaining more, amassing more prosperity and how God wants you to bless and everything like that. And, and the church was... <laughs> At that time, they were, they were really, I mean, people were coming from far and near to be a part of that work. And not one word that brought conviction to my soul. Then I go and I listen to Joyce Meyer, and she would prick my heart. <laughs> she would prick my heart. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, I need to get out of this sin. Ah, da, 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 da. And you know what? I'm thanking God for preachers who will not compromise who will tell me. So guys, tonight, as we prepare to go, I couldn't finish this. I never finished my messages for some reason unknown to me. But I pray tonight that you've got something a little bit that jarred you or stirred your heart, that pricked you, that said, you know what, he's right. There's some things that need to go out of my life. That can't stay anymore. This is a distraction to me. That's a distraction to me. That's a distraction to me. That's a, there's some places I don't even go because I know I can't lend my eyes to seeing everything. So therefore, I have to make the choice to create or be in an environment that I know is safe and trustworthy. It took a while, but I got to that place whereby I could make decisions and say, you know what? No, that ain't good for me. I'm not going to do that. It's just like when it came down to the time for me giving up pork. I gave it up because I knew it wasn't good for me. Little did I know that years, maybe 10 years later, I would suffer a stroke. And that's what I did. But I thank God it wasn't because I was on pork. It probably would have killed me. So folks, tonight... Let's make a recommitment to God. Let's do like the old folks used to sing about. They used to say, search me, Lord. Turn the light down of heaven on my soul. And if you find anything that shouldn't be, take it out. Strengthen me. I want to be right. I want to be saved. I want to be whole. Let's ask the Lord to search us. David says, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Stand on your feet, please. You know what that thing is. You know what that distraction, you know what that thing is that lures you and baits you away. Oh my, I pray that you let the glory, the brightness of heaven shine on us so that you can expose anything. You said that those things that are, 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 are brought, uh, brought into light by the light are exposing the works of darkness in our heart. And Lord, there's a lot of things that distract us, that turns our attention to the left, to the right. We start on course with you. We start the race with you. But somehow or another, we don't get to the finish like we should, Lord, because there's so many distractions. This thing is pulling at us. This is pulling at us. Workers pulling at us. Jobs are pulling at us. Careers are piling, piling up on us, Lord. Everything is coming to distract us. Things, Lord, the amassing of wealth and all of these things, Lord, that come to distract us, oh God. Relationships. This one. That one internet always on the on the computers and everything father so many things in our world that distract there's many voices in the world that distract us but lord tonight i pray oh god that every man every woman under the sound of my voice heard this message tonight I pray that the voice of the Holy Spirit would resonate long after I'm gone, long after the lights are out, Lord, long after the, 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 the praise team has stopped singing and the, and the organ stopped and the music stopped, oh God. I pray, Lord, that when we're in the quietness of our house tonight, that you would resound with the voice of God, letting us know you are the guy, you're the man. Search us, O oh Lord, as David said, and know our heart. 
try us and know our thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Here we are, we're standing before you, Almighty. Lord Jesus, you know those things, those lovers like Solomon that we have in our lives, those things that we don't want our neighbor or those, our sister or brother to know about, those things that just tantalize us and that we, we kind of uh, we, we like hang out with all the time. You know those habits, Lord, that we have in our lives that's a distraction to us. Lord, I'm asking you tonight, tonight, start the process. I'm not going to ask you to supernaturally remove them, but Lord, bring us to a place whereby we remove them ourselves, that we'll discard them, Lord, that we'll put them away. You said, put it aside, put it aside. If you then be risen, seek those things which are above, which are Christ, which Christ dwelleth at the right hand of the Father. You told us to do these things. So Lord, when they're done, when we look at ourselves a year from now, We'll see that we've changed, we've grown, we've budded, that we have flowers on us now, on our branch, our thorny branches. Because we've chosen to get rid of the things that displease you. We thank you, Father, for this word tonight. I thank you for it personally. And I give you praise, I give you glory, and I give you honor. In Jesus' name, if you're here tonight, listen. I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard thus far, and I, I'm so sorry. I did not get a chance to finish that message, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit right here on this couch, and I'm going to teach the second portion of this message. You know, I'll, I get opportunity to share at where I go to church every now and then, and so um, when I get a chance to share, sometimes I have more notes than time. <laughs> and so that was one of the times that I had more notes than times. Uh, so anyway, so I want you to stay tuned for the next segment of this entitled Distractions. And I want you to share it with somebody because, listen, there is somebody beside yourself that need to hear what you heard today. I know it'll change your life. I know it'll revolutionize your, your thinking. And these are the things that we need to really concentrate on doing while we're here in this day and age in the earth. Because the Lord is coming soon. He's coming to get his bride. And I just hope that you've enjoyed what you've heard. And stay tuned for the next portion of this teaching.